Hello, Art Historians, and welcome to our first lecture of our final unit for the semester, where we're going to be learning about the art of the Byzantine Empire. Okay, now, very important to understand context-wise, all right? The Byzantine Empire is basically all that was left of the entire Roman Empire. Basically, if you cut the Roman Empire in half, the western half collapses and gets overrun by all kinds of different groups. The eastern half, which is located in Byzantium as their capital, that is going to remain, and that is going to become what's called the New Rome. And essentially, you've got something going on here where the people in the Byzantine Empire are still kind of stuck in that classical Roman past, um, which also includes a lot of Greek influence, but they are going to be doing some things new as they establish their own identity. One big thing that is going to continue from the Roman Empire into the Byzantine Empire that's going to have a huge influence is going to be Christianity, which was made legal in 313 CE by an emperor named Constantine. And eventually it becomes the official religion of the, the Roman Empire before it collapses. So there's going to be a couple things we need to know about Byzantine art. Number one, it's really going to be based in Christianity. That's going to be a huge deal, especially because the emperor was the head of the, the church in the Byzantine Empire. So he's really going to reinforce it. And also we're going to see a lot of continuity of things that we've seen art and architecture wise from the classical Greek and Roman side. Okay, so one really big important thing in Christian worship in the Byzantine Empire and actually in Christianity in general was icons. And icons were images. And that's what the word in Greek means was an image of a religious figure like Mary or a particular saint that people could pray to whatever, like they could visualize that person whenever they were praying. It was almost like a channel for them to communicate with that particular saint or that particular religious person. Kind of like the portrait of Sin Suk Ju. It was there for you to be able to visualize the ancestor and be able to really send your worship to them. Now, icons were believed to have magical powers. They were carried into battle sometimes. They were kissed a lot. In fact, they were lacquered over like with a nice material to keep them from getting faded. They would be found in churches, homes, around people's necks. I mean, they were considered, they could be protective in nature. They could be powerful, but there was some very specific rules about how you showed icons. And one of those is that they were always on a flat surface like wood and had a two-dimensional appearance. They were not supposed to look 3D at all. And I'll explain why. So the I, there was this big thing in Christianity with the Ten Commandments where one of those is you shall not worship any other idol. So like a golden calf or something like that. Like anything that could be confused as another god, you are not supposed to worship that. And if, that includes even praying before it. So there were very specific rules about these icons to make sure that they did not look too naturalistic because we know that the Romans could have made things look naturalistic. We've seen that We've with the bust of the Roman patrician, but you weren't supposed to do that because it could look too lifelike and then you could be worshiping that thing instead of worshiping the actual idea behind it. So for example, no frontal poses, like you don't want to be like, two towards the front, like even if your head was slightly at an angle, you don't want there to be depth in the body so it looks like it's three-dimensional. It looks very flat, like very cartoony. Um, the message behind it was the gestures that they were making, almost like the mudras in Buddhist and Hindu art, the gestures like making the sign of the cross, the colors like could be very important, like blue or red, those are very symbolic. But the, it's very important these icons don't look too human, not naturalistic, because you don't want to be worshiping them. So for example, they don't need nostrils, right? Because these things don't need to breathe. Um, their mouths are not open because they don't need to eat or breathe. Um, they're never like grounded. Like so if they're standing up, it's almost like they're floating. Like they don't make it look like they're standing on the ground because that would look too naturalistic. So that's a big rule is don't make these things look too human. So you can see here, like very big deal. The head is just slightly off centered. The, you know, Mary is looking kind of down in a way in this one. Very cartoony, not a whole lot of depth until, unless they were later icons because then it started to become okay. A couple other examples, Jesus, Mary. Yes, we'll get into why baby Jesus looks like an old man in a second. Okay, um, there, I'll get to this in a second. This is in the wrong place, sorry. Okay, now, 
in the Byzantine Empire, Mary is going to become a really, really big deal because as Christianity started to really develop, there broke into all kinds of fights and arguments about things like when is Easter going to be celebrated? When are we going to celebrate Christmas? Because it looks like he was actually born closer to August than December. Um, how important are different saints, for example? And one of the things that continually came up was how important Mary was. Like, was she a holy figure or was she just a human that gave birth to Jesus? So at one discussion in 431 CE, in the Byzantine side of the empire, there was a council call to determine whether Mary was the mother of a God and that made her herself divine and godlike, or was she just the mother of someone who, you know, became a God? So eventually what the Byzantine empire decided is that Mary is a really big deal because she is the mother of God, which makes her divine in her own right. So in the Byzantine Empire, Mary becomes a really big deal. She's known as Theotokos, which is Greek because they speak Greek on the Byzantine side because it's closer to Greece for mother of God. So she becomes a huge central figure. And if she's going to be important, they need to figure out a way to show her. So they start making her look like she's a Byzantine empress. So the Byzantine Empire actually sets the standard for how Mary is shown in art. And one of the main ways that she's usually shown is holding Jesus in her arms or on her lap. And this makes her the throne of wisdom because Jesus was the wisdom. He had all the answers. Him sitting on her lap makes her the throne of that, making her very important. And you'll notice in Byzantine icons, she's always in like a dark purplish blue. And that's because that's what the empresses wore, because it took a whole lot of dye from these one particular snails that could create this deep, dark color. And the more it takes to make something, the more importance it is. It takes that, that much more effort to make it. So she is shown very commonly in Byzantine art with not a whole lot of red, but definitely a whole lot of that purplish blue, because that's what it would have shown her status as an empress in the Byzantine Empire. Now, fun fact. The picture before that I showed you of Mary in Europe, Mary's usually shown in like a very light blue, a very pastel blue. That's because they wouldn't have had that color in Europe to make Mary look like. They wouldn't have worn those dark colors like that because they didn't have that. Byzantine Empire is very close to the sea where they would get those snails to create that particular color. So she's also shown usually on a golden throne, sitting on a purple cushion for royalty, jewels all over her. Even though she's supposed to be this simple, you know, mother of, of Jesus, she would usually have a halo. That's something from classical Greece and Rome because they, you, you know, used halos for like the sun god and stuff like that. And Christian figures adopted that. And typically Jesus is sitting on her lap with a baby's body and an old man's face because he's wise, he's Jesus, and they don't really care how naturalistic it looks. It's more important about the idea. Case in point, Mary who always looks tired, like the baby kept her up all night, and then Jesus looking like an old man with a baby's body. So why is Mary such a big deal? Because basically everybody was missing a mother figure. Like every other religion before this had had some kind of mother figure in it. Like Egypt, it was Isis, um, who was the mother to the god Horus. In Roman Greece, it was Juno and Hera. Um, so Greece, it was Juno, and or excuse me, here in Greece it was Hera, in Rome it was Juno, and they were the goddesses of the home, and that had kind of been missing in Christianity. And these were remember, this was the remnants of the Roman Empire; they were missing that mother figure. So therefore, Mary kind of became it and became a goddess in her own right, but not actually a goddess. She was, you know, there's only one god in Christianity, but she became a very big deal, kind of filling that mold, and she was given a halo just like Jesus, because she was considered to be divine, which the Byzantine Empire decided. Okay, so a piece that shows the importance of Mary and also shows the importance of icons in the Byzantine Empire is this piece. It's the Virgin and Child, which she's the Theotokos, the mother of Jesus. She's shown with the baby between Saints Theodore and George, all right? And this icon right here is really, really interesting. Number one, it's made of a medium called encaustic. And encaustic is actually a, it's paint mixed with wax. And when you paint it, creates like a glowing luminous effect, which works really perfect for this um, because it creates kind of that heavenly appearance. 
Mary is sitting right there in the middle, and on each side of her are Saints Theodore and George who fought for their faith, and one of them actually died for their faith. And one of them's usually shown as like a Roman soldier, and one of them, like, they're wearing the symbol of the cross on their chest, kind of like they're warriors. They are there to show the triumph of Christianity after all these Christians had been killed by the Romans, and to show the, you know, power of Christianity. Now, if you're looking at this, you may be noticing that, and obviously there's the halos because we know that they're divine figures. Okay, if you look in the background of this, you'll see that it looks a little weird. You've got in the background two angels who are making very dramatic expressions, like oh, like looking up at God who's reaching down like with a hand. And then you've got Mary, George, and Theodore who are kind of like just standing there, not really paying attention. They think this was created by two different artists. The artist who did the angels was most likely trained in classical Rome. Like he knew how to make things look dramatic and expressive, kind of like the Ludovici battle sarcophagus. Whereas the ones who did Mary, Theodore and George right there in the middle are much more Byzantine, trying to make things look not as human-like. You'll notice like their mouths are closed. There's no nostrils where the, the angels in the back, that guy's mouth is definitely open like, oh my God. And then you've got right there in the front, Jesus looking like an old man on a baby's body. So not very naturalistic at all. Another thing about Mary is something called visual hierarchy, which she tells you how important you are by if she looks at you or not. And notice that she's not even looking at you as the viewer, which means that she recognizes that you are not as important as she is. Okay, now one thing that's gonna happen in history in the Byzantine Empire is something called the iconoclasm. And what happens is one day a Byzantine emperor who had kept losing battles to Muslim forces nearby decided to ban all of the icons. Okay, the reason he did this is one reason he thought they lost is because, oh, the Muslims don't show figures in their art. They don't show humans, especially religious figures. Maybe that's why we lost. Not because I'm a bad leader, but maybe that's, you know, because we show icons. So he ordered icons like this one to be completely destroyed, like absolutely destroyed in something called the iconoclasm. Now, meanwhile, because he's head of the church in the Byzantine Empire, he can do this. Meanwhile, in the Roman side, where the Pope still lives in Rome, he said, no, icons are fine. You can keep practicing them. It's fine. You can keep using them. And it turns into this power struggle over who has the authority, the Pope who says he's over all Christians, including the emperor, or the emperor who says, no, Christianity on the Byzantine side is mine. What this leads to is a split in the Catholic Church into two different groups of Christians. One is the Roman Catholic Church, which is based, and they follow the Pope of Rome. On the other side, there is the Greek Orthodox Church, which does not recognize the Pope as important. And over time, these two different groups developed even more differences as they separated themselves from each other, even with the design of their churches, but they never, ever got back together. And this right here shows you the divide, even to this day of this schism or this split between Roman Catholic and then basically everybody in Eastern Europe adopted Greek Orthodox, including the Russians, which we'll talk more about later. Now, once Christianity starts to become this big a deal, it needs to spread. And one of the ways that you do that is by writing stories, including stories from the Bible. That way people could learn about the miracles and the message and convert over to Christianity. So what we start to see happen is a shift away from papyrus scrolls, which could just be like stretched like this, to a codex, which is a handwritten book. And in the Byzantine Empire, anything that's handwritten takes a really long time to do, especially in the Greek language, which again, the Byzantine Empire uses. So people in the Byzantine Empire who have a lot of money because it's located right at the juncture of three different major trade routes. So this area was loaded basically, could afford to purchase these codexes to show their wealth and, of course, their devotion. And again, they're going to be written in Greek instead of Latin because Latin is on the Roman side and these guys speak Greek because they're spoke closer to Greece. Now, one example of these codexes was the Vienna Genesis, and it gets its name for two reasons. Number one, the Gen Genesis is the first book of the Bible. The Vienna Genesis gets its name because it's located currently in Vienna, Austria. And this book is what we call an illuminated manuscript because it's not only got writing, it's also got pictures. And those pictures illuminate or shed light 
on the meaning of the words, especially if you couldn't read, which a lot of people couldn't. So it was created within the Byzantine Empire, and it's made up of lots of miniatures, which means miniature paintings. Like these aren't big, they're mini paintings because they they're small, they have to fit on the page. The medium of this is vellum, which is calf skin, like baby cow skin, which they would then turn into parchment that you could write on or paper like, like a paper that you could write on because obviously it's not paper, it's calf skin. And it was dyed purple to show wealth, which means whoever owned this definitely had some money. And it contains stories from the, the first book of the Bible. But here's the thing, <coughs> excuse me. It definitely shows that these guys still had that classical past link to ancient Greece and Rome, even though it's written in Greek, which is more the Byzantine Empire. Okay, so this is one scene from the Vienna Genesis on one page. And it's a scene of Rebecca visiting the well. Rebecca is the woman in pink, dressed very much in like Roman style clothing. All right, but definitely with the purple of the Byzantine Empire, like definitely that style. And here she is, she, it's a narrative. She's shown in multiple scenes, she repeats herself, going to the well. And as she's going, notice the columns that she's passing by, very much Roman. And she passes by in a story from the bible a naked river goddess that would have been something from ancient rome so it's kind of like they just couldn't get away from that ancient roman past all right and a little bit greek because nudity because the romans weren't really into nudity so that's a little bit different there she is in her second scene she first scene walks past the naked river goddess and then goes to the angel comes to visit her and there she is just ignoring the naked river goddess i don't know this is another scene from the Vienna Genesis. This is the, uh, the story of Jacob wrestling the angel, which starts up at the top with Jacob traveling, right? You can see him. Then he crosses over a bridge, a Roman style bridge with arches and columns, and then comes down, wrestles the angel, and you see him multiple times throughout this scene, kind of like the column of Trajan. But again, this in a Roman style togas, basically. Roman style columns, Roman arches, all written in Greek up there at the top. So you've got Byzantine, but you've also still got this continuity of the same repeating figures, kind of like we'd see in the Column of Trajan. Okay, now we can't talk about the Byzantine Empire without talking about the Emperor Justinian, who really is the highlight of the Byzantine Empire. He is known for so many things, least of which his marriage, this true love match he had to his wife, Theodora, who came from very humble backgrounds and rose from rags to riches to be the emperor's wife, right? Kind of a big deal. And she was super intelligent in her own right and was really influential on his policies of how to treat women, how to treat the poor. He's best known for basically trying to go back and put the Roman Empire together, but this time under the Byzantine Empire, unifying it under one law code called the Justinian Code, where he took laws from all over the empire and basically put them into one concise law code where there wasn't any, you know, um, differences on the laws. Like, this is the one that we're going to follow, any inconsistencies, and really promoting religion, Christianity within the Byzantine Empire. Why? Because he's the head of the church. If people support the church, they also support him. And he's really known for works of art and architecture that reinforce that. So the number one piece for this is the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom, which was originally built on a, hang on, I think I updated the slide. Here it is. Sorry, updated that slide. Go with this one, okay? The Hagia Sophia means in Greek, the Church of Holy Wisdom. And Justinian built this on the site of where other churches had been built. And he did it after the Nika revolts, where people basically got riled up after a chariot race and came to try to overthrow him. And basically Theodora was like, I will die an empress. Get out there and deal with this problem. Like she told him what to do. And this church was built where the last church had been built down and it had had, like the other church before it, a wooden roof, which is not necessarily a good thing. So when he had it rebuilt, he was like, no, we are going to replace this with a stone roof and an even more 
important roof and a bigger roof that's really going to show the importance of me, the emperor, because I am the head of the church and we're going to show just this really, really impressive church. And he hired architects who had a great deal of knowledge in Greco-Roman engineering to build this thing. So this is the exterior view of the Hagia Sophia. Notice I'm saying Hagia, like the G is kind of like silent instead of Hagia, it's Hagia. And it's located in what is today Istanbul, which used to be Constantinople. And yes, that is the song. So it was Byzantium, then it was Constantinople when Constantine moved the capital there before Rome collapsed, named it after himself. And then once the uh, Muslims took over, it became Istanbul. So today it's Istanbul. And you can see by looking at this just from the exterior right off the bat, you've got a barrel vaulted arch right there at the entrance. You've got this huge, massive dome. So you do have these continuities coming from Greece and Rome, but they're really going to take this building up a notch. So the interior is kind of like a basilica. It does have the nave right here in the center, like Santa Sabina. It has the apse at the end of it, but it is a central and actually designed building because you do have the central focus of the dome over it, but there is an axis that runs towards the altar, which is covered by a little half dome or semicircular dome. You can also see there is the two layers of columns and then there's a clear story at the top, a clear story of windows. So that's another continuity, but we have to talk about that dome. All right, so the goal of this was to create a ceiling that was even more impressive and less destructible than the wooden ceilings of the two churches prior. And they also covered the inside of these buildings with lots and lots of gold mosaic because gold glitters and sparkles, which does two things. It says, wow, this empire is really wealthy to be able to build something like this. And it creates this heavenly appearance, reinforcing the power of heaven and the church, which also reinforces the emperor. So kind of double fold here, triple fold, if you want to look at it that way. So the goal was to have a ton of windows that all of this light could come through and catch on these mosaics and glitter and sparkle and create this heavenly effect. So the Hagia Sophia does have the clear story, but it also adds another layer of windows, get this, at the bottom of the dome, which means that you're taking a lot of weight out of the bottom of that dome to support that really heavy top of the dome. So here is what the architects did to support that dome. What they did is they took four arches to create the walls. And where the arches meet, they put the arches in a square, and where the arches meet, they bent it, where it creates kind of like this concave shape like this, all right? So kind of like going like this, where they're all going in towards each other, and then the dome sat on top of those. And that area where the arches meet, that they caved in, they filled that area in, they didn't just leave it like, because if two arches meet like this, you've got this open space right here. They filled that in, and then set the dome on top of it. But it just looks like it's floating because it's sitting on, cop on top of those windows that you can't really notice that it's sitting on top of the pendentives. This area is called pendentives. And then to hide them a little bit better, they put six, six winged angels in those pendentives on the inside to kind of disguise it and create this heavenly appearance of angels. So you can see here this filled in area where the arches meet, that's the pendentive. And then the dome sat right on those. So here you can see where the angels are right there. You can see the angels that are in the pendentives. You can see it right there. And then later on, this dome did collapse once. So what they did instead is you can see it looks like there's ribs around the dome. Those were added to kind of reinforce it. Kind of like the, the things that you use, the rods to hold up a tent. Right? It just kind of like helps support it a little bit better. So the nave of this building, you can see right here, is filled or would have been filled with a lot of mosaics. Up at the top where they would have been too high to reach, you can still see the remains of the mosaics. And during Justinian's time, there weren't a lot of images on these. There were the angels, but there weren't a whole lot of like figural images like, of the, like Jesus or Mary or stuff like that. It was just straight gold where the light coming through the windows would sparkle off of that and you'd see the angels floating up there in heaven. Now, Justinian knew what he was doing. He wanted to make a statement that all parts of the empire should be represented in the Hagia Sophia to make the statement that this is all of us. So 
every single part of the empire contributed something to the interior of the Hagia Sophia. So for example, the marble from the floors is from Turkey and Syria, which was made to give the appearance of flowing water because this area sits right on the water, on the Mediterranean Sea. It connects to the Red Sea. Like water was a big part of wealth for this area. There are 104 columns that came from all over the empire. Some of them came from a Greek temple that was in Egypt. Because remember, Alexander the Great took over Egypt and built temples there um, and brought those columns back to build this one. And there is a marble slab right in the middle of the floor that stands out. This is where emperors were coronated, crowned in the church to kind of give this message that, hey, this is like the kings, the emperors come from God. They are blessed by God and they are head of the church. So that was a big flex moment. So this is the floor plan of the Hagia Sophia. You can see the dome that is the central focus, but it does also have an axial design running towards the apse. And notice right here, there's also the imperial door that only the emperor could come into during religious worship so that he could help with the ceremony. Because remember, he is part of the church. He is the head of the church. So he had his own distinct entrance to get in. And then down here is the apse, which we've seen before in basilicas. So there's another view of the floor plan right here for you guys. One thing about the capitals of the columns, the tops of the columns in the Hagia Sophia is really interesting, is their basket weave, which looks like there's pieces taken out of it, which really you would think would destroy their structural integrity. They're weaker to be able to hold up the ceiling. It did, they didn't need to be that strong because the ceiling was held up by the arches, kind of like the Colosseum, like the arches or the columns are on the outside, but they don't actually really do anything. That's a little bit of the case with these capitals and these columns as well. They're decorative, which is like, hey, these are so like, we, our building is so well supported. We don't even have to have full blown columns to be able to do this. Now the mosaics in the Hagia Sophia are such a huge deal, especially like the entire ceiling was basically covered in gold. And then you've got the angels in mosaics. Mosaics are something we already know the Romans did. We've seen that with the Alexander mosaic that they had in one of the houses in Pompeii. These mosaics, a lot of them, because of different things that happened, were either destroyed by people ripping the gold off the walls because it was gold pieces that were on the wall, or they were plastered over or removed during later times. So we don't have, a, like, we have the iconoclasm issue where we're going to tear down icons. Um, you're going to see different religious groups come in that are like, we don't show figures, so we have to cover these up or take them down. But later on, they did start creating mosaics again. But by that point, they were going for a more naturalistic approach. So some of the mosaics are still there, but they're just from much, much later. So like, for example, here's another one that is in the Hagia Sophia that I guess was too high up for them to destroy. And here we have Mary in her dark empress robes, almost bluish purple with Jesus on her lap as an old man um, in a baby's body. And here you have Justinian offering her and Jesus the Hagia Sophia and then Constantine offering her the city. So kind of like, hey, these are all for you, Jesus and your mother. So even in these mosaics, there we're going to see the return of hierarchy of scale. Um, Jesus is always in the middle and he is always the largest. That's just an important part. He's usually shown as the panto creator or like the creator or ruler of the world, always with a gold background because we know he's the, they believe he's in heaven. Um, and then lower religious figures would usually be in a hierarchy below him. So like Mary is obviously dead center in the middle. She sits up higher and then saints and angels on the sides, depending on like your importance in the hierarchy. Now, the Hagia Sophia looks a little bit different today than it originally did. Um, and that's because in the 14th century, the 1300s, Constantinople was sacked by the Ottomans. And the Ottomans were Muslim and they were the Ottoman Turks. And the, this is where Turkey gets its name. And when they came in, one of their ways of showing dominance was by coming in and turning the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, um, which is a Islamic place of worship. Now it does have a Qibla wall in it, which is a wall in a mosque that faces towards Mecca because every Muslim prays facing towards Mecca. So that Qibla wall designates where that's located. So it points towards Mecca so people know which direction to pray. 
Um, and they took down a lot of the mosaics that they could reach of images like the saints and stuff like that, because even though Muslims recognize Jesus and Mary and Moses and Abraham, they don't show people in religious art. It's considered idol worship. So they took a lot of that down and replaced it with four huge medallions that have the names of the first four people who led Islamic empire after Muhammad up on these walls. Also on the outside, they added four minarets, which are used to call to prayer. Um, people, it, like, acoustics echo out. And this was a visual symbol that this area was no longer a mosque. Now, later on around the 1900s, you're going to have a less religious, like he's not a religion and politics person combined leader. You have a more secular leader named Ataturk who decided to declare this place a museum for everyone, for every religion to come to. But most recently, the leader of Turkey has decided that because there's so many issues going on, he reconverted it into a mosque and was all about restricting access to it. So there's just another view. You can see those four medallions right there. This is the Qibla wall. And there's like, this is called a mihrab which is like this gold structure, like with the Arabic writing, the calligraphy around it that tells that, hey, this is where Mecca is. So you face this direction to pray. And there's the four minarets on the outside. Okay, so eventually what's gonna happen is Justinian is gonna start expanding the Byzantine empire back to the West to try to put the Roman empire together. And as he did that, he established what was called Byzantine provinces, which you don't really need to know. Just understand that he was expanding Byzantine empire back that direction and kind of installing local Byzantine leaders in that area to kind of keep an eye on things. And one area that became a province was Ravenna, Italy, which is one of the locations. So it's in Italy, like it's, it's back towards Rome, but it's one of the best examples we have of the best preserved Byzantine architecture and icons that wouldn't have been destroyed in that iconoclasm as they were closer over towards Italy who had no problem with the icons. And this church of San Vitale was named for a Christian saint who had been martyred, died for his faith, and it was paid for by a wealthy banker, kind of like as a way to like, you know, show homage to the Christian church. That's where Ravenna is, where that little star is right there. Now, San Vitale is just like other Byzantine churches. It's going to have the central design with a dome on the top. And it's cool because San Vitale is in an octagon shape. It's got eight sides. Really cool because that's that much more walls to put mosaics on. And this building has some of the best Byzantine mosaics that exist on the planet. Like they have some of the best, most elaborate mosaics. It's incredible. And there are, just like with the Hagia Sophia, there are windows at the base of the dome which can be used to like highlight and glitter all of these mosaics and create that heavenly effect. So really, really interesting how they did that. This is the plan. You can see this is the plan of it, that it's got the narthex, like a regular basilica. It has the apse, but there's that central design underneath the dome and then the eight different sides. That's the dome looking upwards. So you can see like, if you're on your back looking upwards, that's what it looks like. And you can see the windows at the bottom sitting on pendentives, so I should point that out. Like there's little pendentives right there on the sides. Now, this is you looking in towards the apse, okay? And you'll notice that right there in the apse, right there in the center on that semi-domed roof, huge mosaic of Jesus right there in the center. All right, and he is flanked on each side by angels and a bishop who is presenting him with this church because it's, it's for you, Jesus, this is all for you. Now on the right side of the apse, okay, on the right and left side. So the, the Jesus would be towards the east, right? So then on the south and the north walls are these mosaics of Justinian and Theodora. And on the right side of the apse, on Jesus's right hand, because he's Jesus's right hand man, is a mosaic of Justinian. And he is holding the bread for communion, which would be done in the apse. Like that's where the priest would serve communion. He is shown with an army on one side, so his soldiers on one side and his church his church officials on the other. But if you notice, he's overlapping them. Like his feet and his arms are in front of them because he is the head 
of the church. And he is signified very naturalistically. Like they're like, this is what he would have looked like in his face. And then a halo around him to show that he's considered to be divine too. And he's got these dark purple robes on, which show that, and all of these jewels on his hat, which show he really is such a big deal. So the message is, here's Justinian. He's got one foot in front. He's got his elbow in front. He's kind of on parallel with the church guy right there to his left. But this is a message that says, Justinian is the head of the church and the state. And this is dedicated to him. He's, you know, because of him, you have all this. Then right across from it, parallel to him. So facing him on the, the north, the south wall is Theodora, Okay. Theodora's mosaic, she is also shown in a very, guys, this is all mosaic. This is insane how many little tiles made this detail. <clears throat> but she is shown wearing a purple robe. Like, so she's important. She's got the halo. She's got the headdress with all the jewels and pearls and everything. And she's holding the wine for communion because she too is part of all of this. And it's so detailed on her dress that at the bottom of it, you can see images of the three wise men embroidered on her dress, bringing gifts to Jesus, just like she's bringing the communion. However, she would be so pissed about this because she, unlike Justinian, is not in the dead center of hers. She is slightly offset and she's not shown with soldiers and church members. She's shown with her handmaidens and her attendants, but not with anybody that's of real importance. And Unlike the Justinian, who's shown in the room to be part of worship, she's shown outside of it. You can see that because off to the side, if you take a look, this guy is like, she's giving the wine to someone else to take inside to the room where she wasn't allowed to be because she was a woman. So here you can see the apse right here. And then, so this would be to the east. And then you have on his right hand, you have Justinian's mosaic. And then over here, you have Theodora's mosaic. And everything you guys are looking at on the walls is mosaic made up of those tiny little pieces. That's the detail on her dress. That's pretty intense, like how specific that was. Now, eventually the Byzantine Empire will collapse after the Ottomans come in and conquer it. What was left of the Byzantine Empire gets run over by, you know, other enemies invading that area. But the Greek Orthodox Church is going to continue, and that religion is going to spread upwards into Russia, who, because they adopt that, they consider themselves to be the third Rome after Rome collapses. In fact, the word czar, which is what Roman emperors called themselves, comes from the word Caesar. They also adopted Greek Orthodox as their religion. And this leads to the creation of a building I hate, 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 hate. And that is St. Basil's Cathedral, which is a centrally designed building with lots of domes on it, um, just like the Greek Orthodox Church would have had. But fun fact, those little onion-shaped domes are because in Russia it snows a lot, and this kept the snow from accumulating on the domes and making them collapse. So fun fact, even though it is a terribly ugly building. <laughs> 